If you'd like to join the ranks of Patreons and sponsor the show, head over to patreon.com forward slash seller door skeptics. For less than a 20 ounce soda or an energy drink each week, you can help sponsor us, the hosts, and our charity of choice. Patreon helps Cellar Door Skeptics create better content, become better activists, and it's going to help you stay healthier by drinking one less soda or one less energy drink each week. Click the link in the notes of the show to sponsor us today because we bring the discussion with the sources. Walk with me through the cellar door. A storm is coming, Francis. A portal to a more skeptical world. Cellar door skeptics begins right now. Prepare for the revolution with your hosts, Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna. Oh, welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Cellar Door Skeptics. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We apologize uh, for a little bit of an erratus in our schedule list. Um, we've, <laughs> we, we've had some, some trouble <laughs> getting together. Uh, Hannah is officially out there on the job market, and he is um, openly spending a lot of time doing interviews. Um, and then between that and I thought May was bad, but June is almost just as bad for me in terms of my schedule for my kids. Uh, my daughter's dance recital is going on. They have to have all these dress rehearsals. It's insane. So we, yeah. we were not able to connect um, until today, obviously. And well, we uh, so could have maybe have connected, but it would have been for me in a different state on rel- on not uh, maybe not reliable internet in, in a hotel. So like, like we figured we would wait till we had our you know our best connections possible because there's nothing worse than listening to a show where people are uh, breaking up the whole time they're talking. That would be just unnerving. Yeah, yeah we we've had that before, and we prefer not to uh, <laughs> to, to do that again. Used to have it all the time until I I brought a, a a cable in, so I would have connection and stay stable yeah and so you know it, again like i said we we apologize for the delay um but another another exciting thing is if you if you check out not another atheist podcast um Ooh. hannon and i actually make an appearance um on their latest show which i i don't know if it's released or not or if it's going to be released this week or next week but we actually appeared on not to tell our story not to talk about podcasting, but to just talk with a couple of friends um, that we have made. I got we've been friends with them for seven years, years now, now. at six, least a few years. Yeah, no, it's got it's got to be almost six or seven years now. We you and I've been doing this together for seven years. So they were they came along about a year after that. So it's five or six years. There you go. And 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 they have a wonderful podcast. Um. Jen is from New York. She's very opinionated. Um, she works um, in atheist activism. And then, you know, Keith is from Canada. So it's even better because we get to make fun of his accent. We get to talk about <laughs> why he needs to take us in as refugees when, when Trump decides to make himself Emperor Supreme. Um, all these different things. When, when Trump says, I'm Snoke, that's when we know we've got a problem. Um. But you know, well, uh, he it, creates it, a weird alliance and treaty before the 2020 <laughs> election because it sounds like he said he was okay with doing that with who knows what. I don't know the big, the big. I think it was ABC or CBS had the big interview where he's like, "Yeah, anybody else out there?" That, basically, he just told the whole world, "If you got dirt on my opponent, I'll take it, even if you're <laughs> a foreign government." That's yeah, cool. Whatever. We don't care. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, look, you couldn't indict me for this, therefore. Boom! Let me just dump it on the table for you. That's isn't yeah. that ridiculous? I mean, I, he's I just, changing the norms, and it's in a regressive direction. Like he is yeah. actually making this kind of behavior normal. This is the stuff that happens in countries just before they become failed states or be, before they become non-democratic. Like these are the kinds of authoritarian authoritarian 
motives and, and uh, decisions, like opening up basically the the president to you know higher than the law standards, or whatever. Like these are dangerous things, and he, I, I, I would guarantee you that he doesn't have a deep enough insight to know the kind of long term ramifications of making modifications like this. Because that interview where he said some of that stuff, it was that was just him talking like in you know a big doofus, like him talking like he would have when he was on The Apprentice and someone asked him an opinion about something that. He he's a human. He has the ability to create a sentence, but other than that, there's there's not a whole lot of background understanding and political science and and thought. It's it's more uh, stream of consciousness. I don't know. It's weird. It's exactly. really weird to think that that could be something that's going to be making decisions and <laughs> norms in the future. We well, you want to know what's funny? And I guess it's a little tangenty, but my um I have a friend um that works at the same company I do, right? And um, today I just happened to be at the facility and, you know, we were talking. He's like, hey, I got to explain something to you. And I was like, all right, what, what's going on? OK, he, explain me. Yep. And he's like, he's like, have you seen the um, documentary from Michael Moore? I was like, I don't know which one. And he's like, I know <laughs> the one about Trump. And I was like, nope, because I kind of find that guy a little ridiculous. I find him over the top. I find. A lot of the stuff he says, uh, borderline crazy to some extent, right? Like he has some good points, but for the most part, he's yeah. really just offbeat. And it doesn't, it's not like, it's not really journalistic. He clearly has a point that he's trying to get off yeah. when, he's, when he's usually working on this stuff. So, like, I don't treat it like I would, like an education documentary. It's a guy with an agenda and he's, basically trying to convince you of his agenda. Yeah. So like, I mean, he, some of the stuff it's worth knowing, but I have never been a huge fan of his stuff either. No. And the funny thing is, is he's like, you know what? I didn't, I didn't know Trump wanted to be a dictator. And I was like, Oh, you didn't know. And he's like, no. And I was like, are you, do you not read the news? <laughs> do you not he's, listen to podcasts? Do you not do anything? Well, not really. Oh. He's like, I guess I'm really glad <laughs> I voted for Hillary last time. Because I can't imagine if I had voted for anyone else. Like he's like, <laughs> I was like, and I'm sitting here going, "Holy crap!" You know, it's amazing to some extent that you, you it, it took you two and a half That's years to come to this re <laughs> revelation. And he's like, "You know, do you know what Trump said?" And I'll say, like, "I don't know what man." And he's like, "You know what he said? He said that um, we just have presidents for life." And I was like, "Yep, that came out quite a long time ago." And yeah. um, we rallied against it. Then you know he's like, I didn't know he said that. I was like, maybe Man, you should pay you know, a little you know, more attention. Gotta, you know, it's got to be unnerving to be that guy. And it's like he's like the kind of person who like like when I when I watched Dexter, I waited until the show was completely done. All eight seasons, I think it was, were done, and then I could basically just consume the thing like I would, you know, a, a trilogy of, of big long books or whatever. Like it's just whenever I had time, I was watching Dexter, and I had the whole thing so I could consume it from the very beginning to the very end, uh, as time allotted. No, you know, time periods of waiting. Like he's got to be like the guy who watches a show like that, like later than when everybody else did. And then he comes into work and he's like, "I'm watching a show called Dexter. It's so cool that he kills people," and people are like. That was really popular like four years ago. <laughs> How are you just hearing this now? He's just like, did you hear what Trump said? Yeah, four months ago. Why weren't you paying attention to the news that day? I I, <laughs> I don't know. I, every once in a while, you see people that uh, that are coming. And it, well, in today's twenty four hour news cycle, it's a surprise when people don't catch some of that stuff. But it's also, I guess, kind of good. That means that there are some people out there who don't just mainstream it directly into their veins and they, they have a life that they can get away from some of this stuff. I try to every once in a while. I just no NPR, no, no, no news websites. And I'll just turn on an audio book and just, I'll just decompress from American politics for like a week. And it's really nice. <laughs> it really <laughs> is. And then of course you got to catch back up, but like, it is really nice to just get away from it sometimes. Yeah, well, and maybe that's how his whole life is, and it's kind of funny because, you know, in relation to that, my boss is um, now finally watching Game of Thrones, right? And his boss and me and, like, I don't know, like, 20 other people at work, we talk, we used to talk about it all the time, <laughs> and, like, all of a sudden, my boss is jumping on board. So, like, the other day, uh, it was kind of weird. You guys, that thing you talked about six years ago? Yeah, like, we <laughs> went to lunch, right, and we're sitting there, me, my boss, and his boss, and we're all just sitting there eating lunch together, and he's like, he's like, oh, 
I can't wait till this one guy dies. And I was like, well, who? who? And he's like, I cannot wait until that ultra religious guy dies. He has to die. There's no way this guy lives until the end of, the, end of uh, you know, season eight. And I was like, who? And we go through this whole thing. And it's, it's essentially it's the guy, you know, who starts the cult, the like super fanatic, um, violent cult. Right. And it's just kind of, and I know you haven't seen it, but it's just kind of funny because he dies off at the end of five or six or something like that, somewhere in there. And it's just like, so he's around boss, for a while, so he's going to frustrate the hell out of your boss's boss. No, 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 no. My boss has already gone past that. My boss fell asleep or something like that during one of the episodes. And like, he's like telling me about things that happen like episodes later, right? And then all of a sudden, I'm like, mm-hmm. how did you miss? Do you not know he's dead? And my boss is like, what? Stop spoiling it. And I'm like, seriously. I was like, do you, you remember are- <laughs> the green fire scene? And he was like, well, yeah, that was really awesome. And I was like, were you asleep the portion before the green fire? Maybe. And I was like, okay, well, that's where that guy died. He's like, what? No way. He's like, who else died? And I was like, well, Marjorie and, you know, Marjorie's um, brother and everybody in the set. I was like, don't you remember Cersei blew them all up with wildfire? He goes, no, I don't, I don't didn't understand remember that fall asleep while they're watching something. Like, I fall asleep I, if I'm too inebriated. Well, yeah, I mean, that's at that at some point there, you're not really watching it. You're just kind of like having a, a soupy party in your brain. But what I mean is like, <laughs> soupy. You're, you're, that's you're the just, name of the episode. Soupy party in your brain. <laughs> that sounds good. No, I yeah, but like that's really what it is. It's like there's a TVM, but your brain's not watching. But like if it's like a TV show that, you know, is on like. I don't know if it's just that I concentrate on television when I'm watching it or movies, but like that is an alien concept to me that you can fall asleep. Cause like if I'm like drifting off and I'm stone sober, I'll just turn it off and go to bed. Like I, I, I don't, I don't know. My, my parents have always have, have, they fall asleep in the middle of movies. So they don't like to rent movies cause like they'll spend $5 or whatever to, to, to stream a movie that's on demand and they'll, they'll miss the second half of it when they all fall asleep. So it's like, why rent this movie? We'll, we'll only watch the first half and fall asleep. Like, even in an action movie that you're interested in, and they're like, I don't know, we just fall asleep in every movie. It's like, why? Just just turn on the Weather Channel or something then and save some money. <laughs> just, I, just I don't know. I, I have the same problem, though, man. Sometimes that some of that stuff puts me to sleep. It just depends on when you watch it, you know? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. It's It's, it's interesting, but it's kind of funny, you know, talking about people that are catching up you know there's there's lots of people that believe different things and don't quite see where we've gone and you know it, it, to me it was eye-opening this week when he goes oh my gosh i mean and it, i didn't think he voted for trump personally you know because he, he's pretty far left i mean he has some very um he has like some he very pro gun views yeah yeah and some very steinish views he, he's very pro you know vaccinations He's very pro uh, women's rights, you know, all those different things. But, you know, he's he's always been that person that says, hey, I want to separate myself from the mainstream and just be an off putting person. And hmm. um, he's always done that. But a it's just, yeah, he's and he goes, you know, I got he's like, I, I sat around and I was thinking I was getting inebriated. And I was like, oh, this sounds like a good movie. I've liked all his other <laughs> movies. And I'm sitting here thinking, well, most of his movies are st- borderline conspiratorial but fine and then all of a sudden you know he's like i can't believe this and and it's just funny though because when you look at that and you look at the understanding of it i think we all see different things like that and so you know like tonight one of the big things i wanted to talk about um was an issue that happened in detroit last weekend um and i and i i can't let this go and i don't think that it, we we posted about it on facebook and we had over like 100 notifications in one and a half days just insane amount of notifications yeah, they weren't just like they weren't like short little teeny ones too like people were writing pretty i guess thought out responses there was a lot of paragraphs and and extended posts where people were really getting into it yep and so i i just couldn't let it go because the problem I have is that when we look at those things and we look at, you know, what the police do, did and we look at, you know, all the different things that happen, if we don't sit down and have a conversation about it, we're just at that same point where we're just ignoring where we're at. 
And, so I guess and, and, but before you get into anything, like what was the event? Because so, for people that aren't in Michigan or, or don't catch up with that, they might not know the event that you're talking about. All right. So the the event was uh, there was a Pride Festival in Detroit last weekend. And at the Pride fe- Festival, um, which has actually been a very big event that's happened in Detroit for a long time, right? In this Pride Festival, what happened was the NSM group, or the National Socialist Movement, which they're not really socialists, they're Nazis. I'm just going to say it. But essentially... Well, they're, this, they're using socialists the way that the, the Nazis said that they were the yes. National Socialist Party. Like, yep. They're basically... Um, what is it? Where they they, they take... They're, they're, what's the term when, they, when someone takes a word? It's... They, they're commandeering uh, uh, yeah, a of yeah, garbage. They're, yeah, they're basically yeah. It's like when someone takes a word and they use it for their own thing. I can't remember. I'll, I'll remember it like some point throughout here. But they're basically repurposing the word uh, or the term socialist for their own, you know, perverted ideas. Because obviously, you know, nationalist socialist party is is a different thing than when we talk in socialism for providing for people. When you're basing it on like nationalism and some of those kinds of things. But either way, so this is like a essentially it's a a, a fancy name for a Nazi party. Exactly. And and the Nazi party decided that they were going to do a counter protest at the Detroit Pride Festival. And what happened was the police, the Detroit police actually learned about this a week in advance. They knew over a week in advance that they were coming and they literally said the the Nazi party said that their goal was is to incite violence at the same ratio that happened in Charlotte, Charlottesville, right? So they were looking to have a repeat of two years ago, except for they wanted them to be the one, the victims, you know, versus, you know, the other people. They weren't going to cause the violence. They want people to do violence against them. Now, they didn't say why. We can all m- make a guess as to why. And, and, you know, for me, the big thing is, is that it, the police knew about this. So they decided to be, in their opinion, proactive. And what what was the big stir was the fact that there's photographs of police with guns literally escorting Nazis <coughs> through the pride parade. Yeah. I don't know. When it comes to that that whole thing, I guess it's the visual that, you know, the, the police and in, in in their defense, they're probably thinking we need to create a barrier between these two groups, but this one group also has freedom of speech where they get to do this thing. So we're going to try to act as a buffer and a barrier. What they didn't think of is what it, the perspective of someone looking in will see not so much the pride parade people being protected from the Nazis by the police, but the other way around, that the police were protecting the Nazis from the pride parade. That's pretty much the, the visual that you get from that. And I don't think the police really thought that through because, let's face it, they're not – PR managers, so they, I mean, police aren't very particularly good at social media and things along those lines. Some of the departments are getting better, but th- this is clearly an oversight on their on their behalf. Well, and I agree with you personally, but before we get too far into that, you know, let's 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 do a couple things. The first thing I want to do is let's examine why the Detroit police decided this was a good. Um, offensive. So I want to make one thing known. There's a couple of issues here um, with what they did that we'll discuss in a minute. But the big thing here is that not only did they not alert anybody, they felt it was protecting the public to keep this knowledge private for five to six days. They did not tell Wait. anybody that the Nazis were coming to Detroit. They literally kept that private. Well, didn't the Nazis like yell it out loud to everywhere they could? I think that they were probably like trying to get as many of their people out as they could, so they probably put posts all over the place. So that's how the Detroit police knew about it, but they didn't warn anybody who was coming out. Yes, that there hey, was... this is a thing that we're worried about. Yeah, and I'll be honest, I have no idea if the um, NSM did that or not. I, I guess I didn't see that in my research. Research. Well, I mean, for it. how would they find? 
how, how would they know? Like, if the Detroit police can get in, either one, they have moles inside these social media groups, like if they're private groups, so they can see what they're doing. So they kind of they're tiny doing research for that, which wouldn't surprise me. But um, and so like maybe only people who are interested in that Nazi group would have been getting notifications or or post about that. But since the police have a couple people in there disguised undercover, maybe they were able to find that kind of stuff out. But so all they basically says, somehow honestly, they knew, all that it says is anyone. that the police chief essentially they had department intelligence indicating they hoped to provoke a situation similar or comparable to 2017 Unite the Right rally. Yeah, so they probably were intercepting communications and something. Then, so okay, so the police knew and they didn't tell anyone that this was going to happen, but they were preparing for it. Yes, exactly. Um, and and the Nazis came prepared. You know, they had cameras. They brought lawyers with them. That's that's and how pre-planned this was. The Nazis brought lawyers with them. Like just that statement right there. That state, you know, if you take that, and again, this is circumstantial, I get it. But if you take the fact that the Nazis openly said, we want to instigate something similar to 2017, and oh, by the way, we're bringing lawyers with us, we're bringing cameras. I mean, I'm ca- come on, man. Like, how? I, yeah. We could talk free guess- speech all we want, but I, I'm, I'm going to say, for fuck's sake, right here, for fucking Christ's sake. <laughs> You tell me how a hate group wants to provoke a demonstration to violence has the free speech rights to come in here and say all this shit and, and to provoke that. It'd be like if I wanted to walk into a church with two loaded M16 saying, hey, I hate Christians and I want to murder everybody. Come on. So let's all do it. Let's, yeah. So like, let's all create a group and we'll all talk about it and then we'll go out and do it. I guess. When no, it comes let's to not me do that. Like, that sounds horrible. I, I don't want well, to do that. I, well, yeah, obviously. So like, that's what I'm saying is like, there, these, these, there's a, there's a plan. There's people planning something out here. And if there is something like just some kind of piece of evidence that where they, the police have, you know, post or something, where they could see that. That would be a clear indicator that it would be within their purview. I would think that it, this is something that needs to either be uh, quelled or it needs to be particularly stopped in such a way that we have evidence that this, they're not just here to voice their opinion. They're here to incite something. Like, if they have some kind of evidence, the police should have done something based on that. Because, like, if, if you post online that you're going to go to a school and shoot it up, the police will preemptively attack that situation so that they get the upper hand and that that thing doesn't happen. This is like someone going online and saying they're going to preemptively try to incite violence at a pride parade. Like there's a little difference between saying, I'm going to go there and shoot those people. But in the end, I would think that that kind of, you know, that kind of assertion that you're going to try to do something and do, you know, make some kind of negative event and some violent event happen would give the police, you know, the, the probable cause to at least try to do something more than protect it so that it can happen. I don't know. It's just, it seems like they, they would have made a better decision what they did here. Exactly. And and here, here you go. That's, that's a really good point. If you think about it. Okay. So for example, in Zealand, they shut the schools down last month, right? They locked the whole school system down everywhere because a kid posted on Snapchat or Instagram, one of the two, basically about how people should understand that things could happen in certain ways at this school, right? They shut our school system down. Literally, there was 20 cops that surrounded this area this kid was in, right? And they arrested him and nothing's come of it that we know of. And that's fine. But they they took very serious recommendation. So on circumstantial what? internet evidence, and exactly, this is probably significantly more in depth and probably visible and provable than that one kid making one post. Exactly, and, and so the- <laughs> we had the Detroit police, and, and here here you go. This is this is this is their this is their argument that was in the Detroit Free Press of all places, right? He says generally generally. Anytime we are aware of a a protest, we deploy resources to that. Our number one goal is to make sure that everybody is safe and to support the constitutional right of free speech. Depending on what we know about a protest, 
sometimes we get information about a protest that it will be violent or potentially violent, and we staff more resources to it. So good. I'm glad you staff more resources to it, but why in Christ's name did you decide to let them walk through the middle of the parade? And and I have examples of, of laws and other court cases that we could, we could talk about in a minute. And then this is what's infuriating to me. And we posted about this on Facebook. And, and I get Nazis have the right to say and believe what the fuck they want. I get it. I get mm-hmm. it. You, you want to be anti-Semitic? Good for you. You want to talk about killing minorities? Good for you. There's always public ramification if you do that. But here's the deal. If we have government institutions protecting these people, walking them through the, the parade, do you not understand what the PR the PR side of this is? <clears throat> I mean, it would yeah. be like if I was walking down Zealand holding a sign and a gun that says, fuck the police, I should kill them all. And the police escorted me down the middle of Zealand saying this. That's insane. I'm carrying a or gun like you, threatening yeah, you were, people. If you had posted online that you are going to go in front of the police station and you are going to try to get them to shoot you. That's kind of what they what they what these guys said they're going to do. We, they're going to take guns and and weapons and lawyers and and hateful things to a large group of people, and they are going to try to get that large group of people to hurt them. Therefore, you know, raising their their presence in the media and you know, driving their their uh, narrative to show that all you know minorities and and uh, non. Uh, traditional sexualities are like Antifa. They're all riotous bigots and they, and they hate the white man and they want to kill him. whatever they were trying to do, whatever narrative they think will boost their perspective and their presence and make them more mainstream. This is, you know, no, one of those ideas of uh, even if you get attacked by a huge mob of people, this would make you look, you know, like the victim. And of course, being the victim is, is something that uh, the minority or the majority white male loves to play lately when it comes to the super and uber conservative perspectives on that. Like they love to say that, well, like um, Fox News loves to say that, atheists are attacking christianity they love to say that the democrats are attacking traditional white male and female couples in america you know whatever they're they're trying always trying to play the victim and these guys intentionally tried to make a situation where they were the victim to boost their presence i I, this is not something that's like oh man this could have been you know it's a coincidence that this happened this sounds coordinated and planned and the police in this situation, like I, we were talking a little bit before the show, there, there's permits and things that you have to get to have these big giant parades. And as far as I can tell, the Nazi group just kind of crashed that. So, like, if you're going to crash that, if anything, the police should remove the crashing people who are there to cause trouble. You can put them somewhere and let them have their free speech, but you don't get to run your stupid thing through the middle of something that people did the right thing, they got the permits, they did the paperwork, they did the planning, they're playing by the rules, and then you get to crash your stupid idea right in the middle of it. That, to me, seems like that would have been, even just that, would have been enough to, for the police to be able to say, no, you guys can't come here, They've, they, they, you know, they have petitioned for this time, and they have the right to the street at this time, and you guys have to go somewhere else. You can yell and say what you want, but you gotta do it over here, away from this, because this is not your space or time. Like, even that would have been better than what they did. Exactly. So, Let's look at free speech laws. So this is directly from the U.S. courts website. This is a government website about educational outreach and understanding Supreme Court cases. Here's what they say about freedom of speech. This is what it includes. Not to speak, right? Or salute the flag. For students to wear armbands to protest war. To use certain offensive words and phrases to convey political messages, to contribute money to political campaigns, to advertise commercial products and professional services, to engage in symbolic speech, i.e. burning flags and protests, right? Yep. But that's what they're calling includes. So, right, so it means Nazis have the right to walk around to burn pride flags that are their own, to walk around yelling that they want to hate people and that their people are not equal to them. 
Yeah. What it does not include, and this is the biggest one here, to incite action that would harm others. Now, they use shouting fire in a crowded theater. I would argue that saying, I want to instigate a, a riot, a riot yeah. where a woman is innocently killed by a car and 38 other people are harmed, to me, that is not free speech. You can also not make and distribute obscene material. Fine. You can't burn draft cards, whatever. You can't permit students to print articles in school newspapers over objections to their administration. You can't have students making obscene speeches. You cannot have students advocating illegal drug use at school events. Fine. I find this. I find it interesting how many things in the does not include the right thing they have here that is basically limiting students to their protests. <laughs> That's <laughs> it true. Seems, it seems Fair like enough. burning draft cards, students printing articles in a student na- newspaper if their administration <laughs> says no, students making obscene speeches. What's ob- what's obscenity? Like the the right to make ob- or distribute obscene materials. What's obscenity? That is totally subjective. So there's two things right there that are subjective. And then, but they're, <laughs> I don't know. It's so like, that just seems weird to me that they're like four or five of these are particularly directed towards young people to keep them in order. You, you darn kids or whatever. It's, I don't know. So, Random so that, thought. That's fair though. That, that's actually, that's a fair statement. But that's not, yeah. Let's, that's kind of a, <laughs> not side, really relevant a side to this, yeah, yeah. You know, I agree with you and maybe we should do an episode on that. So another case that came up and that I think is very important to look at, right? You know, is the case of Snyder versus Phelps. And everybody knows Fred Phelps from the Westboro Baptist Burrow or whatever you say their church name, right? And yep. the Baptist, the crazy Baptist church, that's what I call them, right? And, and it, what do we all know he does? He likes to protest at funerals. That's like a big thing for him, or it was, you know, not anymore it isn't, but it was a big thing for him. It was a big thing for their whole organization, right? They like to protest at funerals. And there was a case that came across that said, hey, this has intentionally eff- inflicted emotional distress because they protested at Albert Snyder's funeral, or I'm sorry, at Matt Snyder's funeral, who was a gay man, and Albert Snyder was his father who said he felt emotional distress and essentially Phelps won this. And there's reasons why he won this. Essentially, they talk about the reason he won this is because of the fact that he was relocated to a certain area. Their protests were not specifically in the funeral. They were not disrupting the funeral per se. Did you feel uncomfortable going into the funeral? Yes. (laughs) But once you got into the funeral, did, did did you did could you hear them could you see their protest no and so the problem here was is that everybody wanted to sue them for emotional distress which i don't disagree with because it would be very distressing if somebody if my son died and somebody's outside protesting because i'm an atheist you know like oh his kid's yeah. going to hell like screw that why leave people alone i get it but let's 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 talk about the legality here for a second and and say the fact that they were protesting on the other side of the street, the fact that nobody could see their signs, the fact that, you know, they weren't using megaphones to the point where it disrupted the funeral. I disagree with them being, you know, them being there. But if we want to talk free speech, they're granted that free speech right to do that. But the difference yep. is the fucking goddamn, you know, Detroit police escorted these people through the pride parade. They didn't relocate them to a corner. They didn't put them on the other side of the street. They didn't keep them away from people. They didn't do anything other than say, I've got a gun, and if violence ensues, I'm going to make sure it stops. Now, you tell me, based on the fucking way the U.S. has gone, how many minorities are going to be killed versus white men? Let's look at the statistics Uh, here, folks. I don't know. I when I said like the, the you said it in a, in a moment ago it's just like the disruption so like protesting something and saying that this is a horrible thing and you hate it but 
you're not disrupting the thing. Like you're not blocking people from having their freedom of speech either. So like, you know, it's like when you see the things where the two, two groups that are processing each other, but are both separated by barriers so that they're both able to do the same thing and their perspectives are bounced out there in the public, the court of public opinion. That's the whole idea to me is that the Nazis in this case, the, the police gave them the unconstitutional right or ability to disrupt the pride parade. Now, like it, like I said earlier, is that if they were the police were just kind of making sure that nobody got into a fight and then like a huge brawl didn't start, but the Nazis were kept off into a place where they were allowed to yell and do their thing, but it did not disrupt. I mean, obviously they're outside, so they're going to yell, and so you'd be able to hear it, and it would make people upset, but. You're not directly infringing on somebody's right to free speech. So if both groups were kept separate and the police were there just to keep the peace as opposed to walking them through someone else's event, like that's like a disruption. You know, that to me is a bad decision the police made in this case. And there's a lot of different layers. And, you know, if you want to because this this conversation usually does the same thing that God conversation does is it devolves back all the way to the very core of should we allow you know, absolute free speech, or should we start blocking some things? And I, this is this is a nuanced conversation, and you have to keep it within the respect of the laws that we have, because there is no objective, you know, perfect law set up for the morality of this country in this situation. So we have to, with respect to what we have, and I think the uh, the police should have kind of just tried to keep these groups separate instead of marching one through the other. That was their big mistake here. If that wouldn't have happened, and this was the, you know, these two these, these two groups happened, and one of them was incredibly ugly, but the police just kept them separate and made sure everyone was safe, I would be okay with the fact that the Nazis were there, even though I hate everything about them. Like I think that is you know it's just something that's unfortunate, but when it comes to you know freedom of speech, protecting my right to do something like that in the future. Or, or someone's ability to to basically pr- stop me from being able to do something like that in the future because of you know some precedent that we set by blocking things that's what the people are worried about is that if you start legislating what happens when the government flips around and all the like what we had recently with the supermajority conservatives but i don't know it's, it, this is this, this case here the police made a bad decision and i but i still think that you know both groups kind of had the right to be out there no, and I don't disagree with that, that the, they have the right to be out there. And they have this thing called time, place, and manner restrictions, right? They, they yeah. have this, and we, we're going to, in a second, I'll, I'll explain what that means. You know, and I agree with you, you know, for example, we join a group called Genesis and Love. I don't know, it's got to be like three, maybe four years ago. And there yeah, was that, an anti-gay, um, you know, Rock, rally. Rockford Construction or something? No, 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 no. It was it was something in Granville. Some Granville um, you know, guy decided he wanted to bring a bunch of um anti gay, um, anti atheist and anti you know, basically these fringe libertarians into Jenison to be at the school system, to be at the school um thing. And the funny thing was and I I got two points to this. One was that we we formed a love protest essentially, and there was I don't know over 150, almost 200 of us that protested this. That basically said you should love everybody. What your beliefs are are hateful. Um, and we were stood there more there. of you than him or there. Yes, their group? absolutely. There was it's literally just like the there Randy was more Blight's thing that he did. Yep, and and and, and uh, let's go back to that point in a minute that there was more of us than them. But we all came out and protested this, and we came together, you know, for example, I'm an atheist. I came together with other churches that supported LGBTQ rights, right? I, I don't care. I was like, hey, do you guys support these rights? Yes. Do you support women's rights? Yes. Okay. I don't care if you believe in a fairy man or the guy that rose from the dead or zombie Jesus. I don't care. <laughs> I, I really don't so care. Jesus. You and I that's both great. agree that um, anybody that's an LGBTQ individual or identifies that way should get the same rights as you or me, and we should get rid of these hateful, you know, people and and relocate them to the fucking kids' table for Christ's sake. If we're going to talk, you know, like Peter Rigozzi, those are the people that that have unintelligent conversations because they can't evolve fast enough to understand that everybody should be equal as long as you're not harming another individual, right? So. We stood yeah. out there, and there was tons of us that protested this. We made the news, you know, at least locally, for this, right? And we did. 
And the difference was we didn't walk into the event. A few people did, but the majority of us didn't walk into the event, disrupt the event. The majority of us stood outside and protested. Those that went inside to disrupt the event were removed. And in fairness, I agree with that because at some point, if you want to disrupt the event, good for you. If you're willing to take the con- consequences, that's okay. But for me and myself, I don't want those consequences specifically right now, especially seeing that there was three times the amount of protesters to the people that showed up and paid to go to the event, right? Yeah. But the difference was is that we stood outside. We had an area we could be at. And yes, we were able to shout at the people that wa- that drove in. We were able to do that. But if we stopped people from driving in, they would have called the cops. People would have been arrested. We even had be- cops drive by, <laughs> drive by be- there and ask us, hey, please don't do this and this and this specific action so we don't have to be here. Yeah, and that was a nice disrupting thing. the event as opposed to just voicing your free speech. Exactly. The, the, once you once you leave the 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 conversation and start becoming a physical consequence in whatever you're doing, it changes the situation. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't think that's that, that difficult. And then in the in the context of what happened here was where the where these Nazis and the police were was in the middle as a disruption. And you know, exactly. I, 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 I really think that's pretty clear, and the police made a mistake here. I agree. And and, and I'll go back to the fact that, you know, he, I I won't tell people they shouldn't go disrupt an event because I believe there's a time and a place for that. And if you're willing to take the consequences for what you do, I, I'm okay with that. Like, I actually mm-hmm. don't disagree with the people that went in to that anti-gay people event and said, fuck you, you're pieces of shit. You people have horrible beliefs. I'm going to disrupt that. I actually don't have a problem with it, but I also don't have a problem if a if they get you know if there's issues that happen with them if they have to face certain legal ramifications. I don't I don't actually have a problem with that, but I believe there is a time and a place we should be disrupting, and then we should turn around and challenge the ability to have that hate speech spewed publicly versus privately. But here's what I want to, uh, before we get into time, place, and manner restrictions, which we need to talk about in a minute, before we get into that, we had a comment on our Facebook page where basically people were like, you know, there's four, there's 20 Nazis, who cares? There's millions of you that don't support it. And I'm saying is, if we start allowing that mentality, we have a problem, right? We yeah. go back to the protests in Jenison. There was more people that protested by three times um, the amount of people that went to that event. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have showed up. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have voiced our opinion. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have been aggressive. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have been there. That we should just ignore this and say this is a passing fad. Because if we allow those things to happen, they will snowball. And I'm not saying Trump's an example of that. I'm not saying anti-LGBT legislation is a sign of that. But we can clearly see The Trump administration regulating transgender individuals. We can see this. They're putting restrictions. They're taking rights away from them. And the problem I have is that if we just say, hey, it's only 20 or 30 people, those are the the, only the people that are ballsy enough to stand up. What about all those people that voted for somebody that wants to take someone else's rights away because they feel that their financial security as a conservative is more fucking important than the goddamn rights of some minority group. And that's the problem I have is that we can't sit back and just say, oh, let's not protest this. Oh, let's ignore this. Let's just let's minimize the fact that it was only four to 20 fucking Nazis. Mm -hmm. Let's actually say four to 20 Nazis could compound a and B. We should still be fucking concerned because we see Nazi tendencies Throughout our laws, we see Nazi tendencies throughout the people that are being fucking elected. And that's the problem here, folks, is if we just sit back and relax and say, it's not a big deal. What do you think is going to happen in two to four years? Do you do you, do you think Trump's going to go for another reelection after he hits two terms? He's already said he has. And we talked a little bit about about conspiracy theory, Michael Moore. But to some extent. That's a reality. If people buy into that and they decide that their political values are more important than what the Constitution says, we have a problem. And that's what I got challenged with. And this is what this is what bothers me the most about this discussion is that 
when I call out the fact that the police were protecting Nazis, and you're saying you don't care about constitutional values, you don't care about you know First Amendment rights, you know you don't care about free speech. Yes, I fucking do. What I don't fucking like is the fact that they get to disrupt other things because you feel their free speech is more important. And you feel the fact that if 20 people get to have their free speech rights, then we all get to have ours. So let them have theirs. And that's a privileged fucking position to be in, my my, my friends. I'm sorry. That is. You and I, Hannah, we, we, we don't suffer the same... Um, so when a, not, yeah, when a Nazi day. gets angry and yells in a park, they're not yelling about me in most cases. I mean, they no. may have a couple angry things to say about non-believers, but they're not, in most cases, it's something that I could completely and easily go undetected in. Like, there are some things that you, you cannot change about yourself, and you would be the subject of their derision. I don't know. When it comes to the, the specifics, like what we were just talking about is the, the arguments that you got a lot on that is like the absolutist versus the relativist or the contextual free speech. And that's where this conversation always devolves to. And it comes into an emotional thing. And it, gets, it, it, it always does the same thing of uh, the God debate. And it turns into the infinite regress. And we start talking about whether or not there's a divine first mover. And it always regresses back to that place where it's either I just believe i have faith in this and then you know non-believers saying well there's no evidence and it's nothing moves forward this conversation has to stay in the nuance of the law it really does like the situation that's here is the most important part and so if you want to talk about the the um the entirety of what society should we just kind of let them do you know a few of them what what's the difference that makes if you ask a lot of the people who are who are um, kind of respecting or giving these people, they're an older baby boomer generation in a lot of cases that are saying, like, it's free speech. They should be able to do this. When they were kids and their parents were out on the park or out in a parade or something was going on, let's say it wasn't a pride parade, but there was a parade happening. And all of a sudden, a bunch of Nazis came out and started saying they hate Jews, they hate minorities. The parents of the people who are in the boomer generation would have would have descended upon these people with uh, with the freshness of the uh, of the memories of what you know letting group, pe- groups and people like this slowly infiltrate your society and change things. It's it was still fresh in their minds, and they and, you know many of them had fought against these kinds of people. In our society, the lack of uh, I guess deferment towards history is making these kinds of arguments slowly edge away and cut away at our democracy. And so, like, whether or not our system is capable of fighting this. So they talk about Trump basically testing our democratic system of of, uh, checks and balances. And he's testing it all right. When we talk about what the president wants to do and how he wants to over just completely ignore um, traditions and things. The same with people doing uh, stuff like this, saying, oh, there's a few Nazis and they're disrupting something. You know, if, like they say, at first they came for this, then they came for this, and then finally they came for something about me, and I was surprised and angry at that point. But you have to stay uh, vigilant, and we have to teach people about the dangers of what has happened in the past, how Nazis were not always this giant massive force. When they first started off, they were a small group who slowly manipulated society into the form that it wanted by dividing people. And so the, the divide and conquer method, I would say that these kinds of things are being used in the United States right now and keeping keeping um, a perspective on what's going on specifically in the law. So that making sure these groups don't get any more powerful through viral media and stuff and holding the, you know, all ca- parties are, uh, accountable. Like it's very complicated what we're doing. And this is the very tiptoe on glass thing. And I don't know if people are treating it as the nuanced conversation that it is. That That's what scares me. This is tough, man. This is not an easy answer. And if someone says they know exactly the answer and there's no question, usually that person isn't looking at this thing in a realistic manner. I don't know the exact answer on how we're supposed to do this. I have a pretty good idea of what's the right thing to, what with the police, what they should have done here. But like stopping groups like this from gaining more power, I'm not certain. I know how I would like to do it by educating children and making sure that people know the dangers of this. <laughs> But we are seriously in, you know, a very dangerous. I don't know if it, but like, if it's because we're older and we're paying attention to this more. If there were things like this when we were younger that we just didn't know about, but 
this is scary. It really is scary because this yeah. is an authoritarian freak out. The whole world seems to be doing. I don't know. It's just, it's just, it makes me worry for my kids. Basically, yeah, it makes me want to move to Canada. But you know, if we <laughs> talk about you know some of the restrictions, right? And this is the last portion of this is time, place, and manner restrictions, right? And these exist. This, these are things that have been tried. These are things that have been talked about. These are things that have happened back in the fucking 60s, man. You know, like, that that's what it is. So TPM, or time, place, and manner restrictions, accommodate public convenience and promote order by regulating traffic flow, preserving property interests, conserving the environment, and protecting the administration of justice. Right? That is what they do. And so the idea is is that we have to talk about this because this happened. For example, there was a um, court case from the six, from the 60s called Cox versus Louisiana, right? And, and, and they basically said um, what had happened was a violation, right? And so what happened was there was a case that where picketing happened of a segregated restaurant in Louisiana, and it led to 23 student protesters being arrested from a black college. And again, this is a little bit more racial to some extent than what we're seeing with the Nazis, right? The Nazis don't care what minority portion it is. They hate them all. But what happened yeah, was yeah. the next day there was a minister who arranged a protest of the the people at the courthouse where the students were being held and the police agreed to allow this protest to happen as long as it was across the street from the courthouse. And the protesters sang songs. They did all these different things. They had a, um, a you know, a, a public lunch. And the sheriff then ordered the protesters to disperse. Disperse when they would not. The police started to use tear gas, and then they arrested the basic, the, basically the minister that was leading the protest. So. We could talk about the so- social implications of this, and I and yeah. I don't think that that's irrelevant, right? Because there was definitely racist tones that went into this. But the idea mm-hmm. was is that they gave them an ability to have a protest across the street, and essentially, what came back from this whole this whole thing was the fact that they were allowed to protest. They weren't doing anything illegal, and if they were using illegal tactics. They were things that they agreed white people should do. Therefore, we have to let the black people do it. And while you and I are going to say, how racist is that? At least we came to a decision. And and the point here is, and this is what I was leading to, is you have a time, place, and manner, you know, relative discussion about what the restrictions on free free speech can be. Can you walk down the city yelling, fuck the police, I want to kill them all? That's a very murky area. Should you be able to walk down a pride festival yelling, I want to kill all Jews. I want to kill all gay people. Should you be allowed to do that? And I'm saying is there's precedents that tell us that these people have been relegated in the past to a area where they can protest. And all I'm saying Mm -hmm. is, while maybe, maybe, what the police did was not illegal. And maybe what the people were doing was not illegal. What the Nazis were doing was not illegal. The problem I have here is the fact that the police fucking escorted these assholes, whether they did it <laughs> as a as a way to help the public or not, doesn't fucking matter. It was a shit yeah. decision. And they should have just relocated the Nazis to the corner. And when the Nazis decided mm-hmm. to try and cross the line, they should have got forceful and fucking tear gassed them and taken them to jail, not escorted them down the goddamn line, not give them the ability to take pride flags out of people's hands and burn them, not piss or simulate pissing on Jewish flags. Oh, yeah, I don't even give a fuck I, that it was 20 people that did this for one hour. Don't give a fuck about that. Relegate them to the corner like you relegated how many black people to the corner to protest. Stop fucking goddamn being racist about this shit and at least be honest in the fact that we're going to say, let's treat people equally. Take the Nazis and let them stand on the corner and yell and scream 
and they could piss on Jewish flags away from everybody if that's what they're going to do. And if you're not going to arrest them for urinating in public, fine. Fuck it. Yeah. yeah. But at least, at least put them in the corner. If there's a rule and a law to what they're doing outside, then yeah. I mean, as much as pissing on, you know, a he is a flag of Israel or a pride flag, just something like it's a it's a piece of cloth. You can pee on the American flag for all I care. I really don't care. Burn it. It doesn't matter to me. Like nationalism, if you have national pride, it's in the idea of your country, not in some piece of paper. Nothing is above, you know, reproach on that type of thing. But like, yeah, pulling out your your appendage and peeing in public that is illegal if they were doing that they should have been cited or ticketed or arrested or whatever the rule is for that and they should have been separate like these these are things that i think if we all kind of put our emotions down and said yes we all just fervently think nazis are disgusting and we do need to think about you know precedents that we set with the law these guys unfortunately are disgusting we need to make to help our society realize that and they kind of create an you know uh, a uh, immune system to these type of ideas by educating our children and and making sure that people remember how disgusting these kinds of groups can be if you give them the time of day to espouse their ideas all, all those types of things I, if you slow everybody down and as much as it's it's really hard to not be super crazy angry about this kind of stuff if you do take the time to look at it a little bit slower and talk about what's going on, like we, we can find a, a, an area where most people can agree. Like I would think that most people would agree that they should not have been paraded through the middle of this. Even if you're in free speech, absolutist or your uh, contextual free speech or, or uh, um, a subjective free speech supporter who thinks that certain words should be, you know, the, that Nazi flags should be banned from society and uh, any of those kinds of things. Like they, in some countries in Europe, if you pull a, a Nazi flag up, you can be arrested in Germany. Like there's a yeah. law they have. That <laughs> exactly. Is, that is a, it's and a here we are in America you, without yeah. that. Like, right, but, come on. You know, I'm sorry. I, you know what I mean? So, like, there's there's those kinds of things. We don't have those here. I do think that, they, you know, as is, is disgusting as it is, we can't particularly go that far. I think the Germans have a special, a special case when it comes to being able to essentially stop Nazi flags from being flown in their country or whatever. But, like, if we calm down a little bit on this and, and slowly think about it, you don't have to go completely one side or the other, and I think there's an area where we could all agree as to you know the etiquette that we should be using in these types of situations. I don't think that's outside the norm, and the fix for this is not a quick one. There's no fast way to get rid of these groups and stop them from gaining social momentum. It's just, it's, sorry, the, the cat's out of the bag. we got to deal with this, and it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be dirty, and it's going to be you know disgusting things, but... Unfortunately, we've kind of had a hands-off approach to that, and we've let you know conservative groups and religious groups start saying that we should have you know prayer in in uh, in our I guess legislative sessions and stuff like that. There's all kinds of things that have been you know pushing and pushing and pushing, and these are some of the results of that. I, 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 this is going to be a normal thing. This is going to happen a lot more. So we kind of need to start having a, a realistic and adult decision about this instead of yelling at each other. Because this eventually it, we lose the ability to um, constructively debate this situation. Eventually, we're essentially we're going to get nothing done ever, and that's that's the worst case that can happen here. Really, it's just we just lose the ability to say Nazis are bad. That's terrible. Exactly. Well, as we wrap the show up, we have our quick saves. So mm-hmm. um, I think we should talk about a quick save. So, Hannah, what's your quick save for the week? We're breathing poison. <laughs> 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 That's pretty much what it is. Um, Cornell, uh, they, they put a special methane sensor on Google cars that were doing maps. And uh, the emissions of methane from an industrial sector... According to the research from Cornell and Environmental Defense Fund, have found that they've been vastly underestimated. And so, when we talk about the amount of methane and some of the uh, greenhouse gases that are in the environment, um, the estimates, you know, using whatever models that the EPA use, they're not accurate to the real world experimental um, results that we've been getting. So, the Google Street View car equipped with a high precision methane sensor drove around. <laughs> And it found that um, emissions from ammonia fertilizer plants were 100 times higher 
than the fertilizer industry's self-reported estimate. So this is a case where self-regulation, again, has failed. I mean, look at Boeing. Oh, our planes are safe. We promise. Crash. <laughs> uh, and it's the same kind of thing. The EPA says, you're a fertilizer plant. And you guys can go ahead and regulate yourselves. You'll do the right thing, right? You'll if you if, if it's high, you'll tell us. You you promise, it, even if it's going to cost you a crazy amount of money. If it's high, you, you'll tell us the the truth, right? Of course they won't. It's for profit. They're they're there for profit. They're not there for environmental protection. And so this is you know this is a major study and uh, use of natural gas and all these kinds of things have been. Uh, it, what it's doing is it's it's essentially natural gas is less dirty fossil fuel, but it's it's natural gas is largely methane when they're doing the fracking processes and stuff. And there's tons of things that leak methane, and this is the probably the most up to date, most uh, accurate uh, study that I have seen that really looks into methane emissions, which I believe are 80 times more potent than uh, carbon dioxide per molecule when it comes to, to uh, or per mole, uh, a specific number of molecules, 10 to the 23 or something. Um, it's uh, This is a big deal. I mean, this yeah. kind of number, a real-world number, is huge. And, I mean, it just makes greenhouse gas stuff that much more important that if our decisions are based on, like, global warming being real, and we're, it's actually going to happen way faster than we thought because our numbers were low when we were saying – holy shit, the Earth's on fire right now. Like Bill Nye said, the planet's on fire and we need to grow up about this. If those numbers and estimates are low that Bill was yelling about and this is what's real, it, it could be even shorter that we start seeing. Like, yeah. Well, think about it this way. It'd be like if a company reported they were making $10 billion a year in profit and then you actually looked at the you know their taxes and you looked at their income and you're like, they're a $10 million company. And they're like, no, 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 we're a $10 billion company. And you're like, or the other way around, we taxed mm. them on $10 million, but they actually made $10 billion. Or, so they, okay. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's like they're lying and yep. they're getting way more of a benefit out of it. Yeah, exactly. And and that's the problem is, is, that, is that it affects everybody. And, you know, like think about if you were a, somebody that bought stock in a $10 billion company. And then you found out it's worth ten million. You're like, well, my stock just lost value. Oh, I just lost money. And oh, hey, I think there's laws against this. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure yeah. there is. Oh, it sounds like a Wolf on Wall Street movie. I don't know, maybe, yeah, eh, maybe. Anyway, you know, like you look yeah. at that, and, and and the idea behind this is that anybody can just lie about their, you know, EPA restrictions, or they can lie about their EPA emission. Eh, fuck that. That's bullshit. There should well, be no way in hell. That any organization that's a for-profit organization ever gets away with this. And we, we could talk about government failures. I mean, we did. We talked about a government failure. We sounded like moderate libertarians a little bit by braiding police officers and their decisions mm -hmm. for the last 45 minutes. But here's an example of where non-regulation or non-regulation and libertarian views fail. They failed. Hello? <laughs> like, how is this that held up? Like, every time a libertarian tells me there should be no laws, I literally should take this article and be like, see, here you go. Just Here's see, lying yeah. for profit. This is why libertarian free capitalist ideas fail. Yeah, the, the EPA is the best example of something as to uh, a way to refute the idea of, of no regulations and the, the meritocracy, the, that it, capitalism will do the right thing. This is a great example. This is just another one. But the EPA, like you, do you remember when they used to talk about acid rain when you were in elementary school? Oh yeah. All the yeah, time. I remember hearing about it all the time. You know, you don't hear about it now. You don't hear about acid rain anymore. You know why? Because we started uh, the clean air act. And that basically stopped all kinds of horrible things from being dumped into the lower atmosphere, which came down in the rain <laughs> and just – and like it would eat the side of buildings. Like the EPA is one of the most successful things that this country has ever done when it comes to regulation, and we've been defunding it. And now if you if you had a strong EPA that could measure and do you know proper measurements as to pollution quantities, you would know that these fertilizer plants are putting out 100 times higher – than uh, their estimates because there would be someone that would be measuring that. We, we yep. don't have enough people out there measuring it. So, like, fund the EPA, even if it's not the most efficient thing in the world. Governments are supposed to, aren't supposed to be efficient. Efficient governments take rights away and take over countries and kill people. Inefficient governments use your money, but they'll actually protect you. So let's, let's, let's go with that option. Exactly. 
So for my quick save this week was uh, it was kind of unique. Uh, there was a Michigan hotel that is now offering free stays to women who want to get abortions from other states. Wow, that's pretty amazing, right? That's so kind of cool. Com- women are coming into Michigan, yeah, and they need to use our abortion services. And so this hotel is like, listen, you guys are coming in. We're gonna help you out and give you a room. Yeah. Like it's the, awesome. the name of the hotel is called Yale Hotel, and okay. essentially they wrote on their their Facebook page this. They said we cannot do anything about the way you're being treated in your home state, but if you can make it to Michigan, we'll support you with several nights lodging and transportation to and from your appointment. That's amazing. Like we could talk about all these negative things, we could talk about the negative things uh, uh, the Detroit police did. But here you go. Here's a lady named Shelly O'Brien from the Yale Hotel who's doing amazing things. And and even if she only gets two or three women that do this, essentially her uh, her idea is is this is a free place to stay for you to get a free legal safe access abortion inside of Michigan until I guess Republicans try to take that away. I don't know, but I, I thought it was amazing, and, and, yeah, and we want to talk about really cool. we, we want to talk about different things about you know it's kind of fun. like I, I said a couple weeks ago you know my company like says when you start a meeting we should talk about you know these certain positive aspects maybe we should have started with this story I don't know but this is <laughs> maybe, this is a maybe. positive maybe aspect. sometimes when we have good quick saves we should do them first <laughs> maybe you know and I think this is a a positive thing you know and and uh, I'm sad that it took a you know. That, that nobody else has has taken to this, and it's only one woman that's done this. And you know, like I don't know, maybe maybe we'll call her up and see if she can come on the show or something. I don't know, but it's just to me that's the cool. best thing about this is that she's willing to offer support outside of you know her comfort zone, outside of her bottom line, to women that are struggling in other states. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's definitely a wonderful story. That's that's a small story about capitalism working. But exactly. I, I would say that small version of capitalism. So like um, if you before you get to the uh, the big giant scale stuff, that's in uh, capitalism can be pretty good. Exactly. I don't know. I hate capitalism. But <laughs> we aren't going to go into that topic tonight. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We had an amazing time talking about how much we hate Nazis and how much profanity uh, Chris can use in one episode. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. this definitely gets an explicit tag. Thank you all for joining us. We'll be back next week with another amazing seller to skeptics. And we promise we will work very hard to get it out um, by Tuesday next week. Thank you all so much for joining us. We'll be back next week with another amazing episode from Cellar Door Skeptics. You've been listening to a presentation of Cellar Door Skeptics. Check us out on Spreaker. CellarDoorSkeptics.com like what you're hearing check out more cellar door skeptics every week right here on spreaker and itunes make sure you come back and check out new episodes with your hosts christopher tanner and chris Hanna. and always remember prepare for the revolution